Okay, sorry for that. So now, now we can we can start. Uh, two things in my presentation. First, uh, some basic key f key data, key feature of the European markets, and then um, I'll develop and explore the what is we have been doing with the market observatory, but maybe more importantly, uh, what is producing and uh, what it could be of use for, for you as researcher. So first, the, the EU market. So it's very much to complement what, uh, what Odum has been presenting a, a minute ago. It's not exhaustive. I just selected some key features that uh, I found interesting to, to share. Uh, the world train is very much on getting aquaculture uh, over fisheries in terms of consumption. The EU is very specific in that sense uh, compared to other regions in the world because the EU is about uh, consuming wild fish. Uh, it remains uh, substantially uh, on, on, this, um, on the consumption of wild fish three quarters against 25% in aquaculture. And this doesn't really change over time. Uh, this has implication in terms of trade. Uh, so basically, we also import much more wild fish than um, aquaculture products. So that's, again, uh, something um, that differentiates the, the EU market. As far as our aquaculture production is concerned, is exclusively or nearly exclusively consumed uh, within the EU. So this is, and the structure of aquaculture is, as you all know, is quite specific in the EU. It's more focused on high value products uh, that is uh, to, to supply mainly for as, as fresh uh, the EU market. So that's uh, something that um, we, we find and that's, those are general trends that, that, that remains in time. Um, even with higher availability of aquaculture products, even, even with the development of mangasus on the EU market and so on. So that's, that's an important thing. Uh, and actually, by just by kind of coincidence, this, the very same structure applies to the, the production in the EU uh, with uh, some, some similar figures. Now, uh, what do we eat? Um, we eat a lot of things, uh, but definitely uh, tuna, cod, and salmon uh, are the are the top top three. Um, I sh we did some work, so all this data extracted from some publication we've done uh, wi with UMOF, and we try to go a bit further and, and identify within our the EU consumption what what share is coming from uh, aquaculture and what is coming from um, uh, from uh, from the wild. And uh, so that's, that's getting to, to this. So it's quite clear uh, that except from some specific uh, species like salmon uh, and, uh, and pangasius, uh, we are very much uh, into, into wild products. Uh, another thing that I found interesting is, oh, as you all know, uh, there's nothing like an homogeneous EU market. Uh, it's not only consumption habits, but it's also quantity and, and amount of money people do spend uh, in for for fish. And it's very clear out of sorry, it was clear uh, out of this uh, shot that if you get Spain, France, and Italy in terms of money being spent for purchasing fish products, you've got already a very big big share of uh, of the EU. And that's something in terms of uh, marketing intra-EU trade or extra-EU uh, trade, this is, uh, this is major. Uh, so it's not only in, in terms of volume, but in, in value. So we try to, to do some further work on that. Um, and this is trend we, that, that remains. Um, it also helps us to see that uh, there's some emerging trends, for example, in Central and European countries, where while consumption is starting from quite a lower level, there's a catching up effect in terms of volume and, and uh, amount of money being spent for, for this. Uh, so this is something we will keep on working on. Uh, in two months time, we will, we will get uh, much fresher data on, on this. We are just uh, working on this and hopefully it's going to be published in by, by June. All right. Uh, 
okay. Yeah. Something we want to develop as well is, um, as it was uh, raised by, by Odum, is that uh, fish is food and fish is protein, and that's not the only protein we, we consume. So there's interaction uh, between, uh, and competition between, uh, between fish and other proteins. And there's some interesting trend to see for quite, a, quite some times in the last few years, fish was uh, in fish prices were increasing relatively lo uh, at lower space compared to meat. And you don't have the figures uh, here, but, uh, but I have, and that's why you will need to, to go in and do for further reading if you're interested. Uh, but since 2013, fish prices have increased much, much faster than, than, food, um, than food and meat in general, where uh, food and meat tend to basically stagnate or even uh, were negative uh, for some months. Uh, fish kept on increasing at uh, a relatively stable, uh, the same speed. So there's something, uh, of, of course it's an index, so it may differentiate very much from one species to another, but the trend is there. Uh, and I think that some work will be interested to, to follow in line with what uh, FAO is doing at, uh, at international level. Now some trends in trade, uh, just just very, very basic. Just to mention that, of course, EU is, is known rightly for being the first market in, in the world for importing fish in value, of course, not in, in volume. But there's also a very substantial trade within EU members. So everyone is basically selling to everyone. Uh, and this represents an extremely important uh, business and amount of money. And basically now, as you can see, it's just about the same. So. Uh, of course, there's some re-exporting, there's some reprocessing, and so on. But just to get uh, some magnitude of, of things, it's all about 20 billion uh, euro of uh, fish being imported into the EU from third countries, and some 20 billion uh, euro of fish being traded within the EU. And so that's a, a substantial thing. Um, now. Uh, on trends for the, the trade balance, uh, well, the trend is, is quite clear. The trade balance is uh, at some stagnate a little bit uh, until 2009, and since then there's a continuous um, the, well, uh, increase uh, of the imbalance somehow. Uh, what is interesting is is the content of this of this change. It's just not uh, the volume. Imp of extra EU imports tend to tend to be quite uh, stable, uh, whereby the value is increasing uh, fast. Which means we do not import just the same thing. It's not the same product mix. We import more more processed product, more fi more fillet, mainly mainly uh, mainly this, much much more uh, shrimps and tropical shrimps, which was nearly a non-market some 10 years ago and now it's a uh, 4 billion ma market a year as big as, as salmon. So uh, there's something uh, very dynamic and, and uh, some important changing, uh, changing in trends. Export. The, while the EU is not too much uh, known for being an exporting country, we, the EU it does export a uh, quite substantial amount of, of fish. Um, and again, you see some uh, in the last four or five years some dif uh, difference between the trend in volume and, and value. So there's a more uh, also, also more added value in uh, in EU exports. Uh, big markets, no surprise for anyone following uh, markets in the EU. Spain is important, I would say, all over the place as a consuming, producing, processing, uh, importing uh, country. Uh, then, usually you meet, you get uh, Sweden, Denmark, and to some extent Netherlands, mostly for their role in terms of hub, uh, mainly importing, uh, registering imports from from Norway. So that's where you get uh, you get uh, relatively high figures for for Sweden, and Denmark, for example. So that's what I, I refer to for for Spain. Uh, so large, in, 
in if you if we compare the the last last year figures with uh, 2013, this increase over the, both in volume and value for all main uh, products, nearly more commodities, uh, with specificity of um, of shrimps, uh, tropical shrimps, getting extremely high uh, speed of, of increase. So that's uh, that's the main feature. Now, uh, if we look at our imports here, there's a very clear distinction between volume and value. So uh, while we do export a lot of small pelagics that represent huge amount of uh, huge volumes. Uh, it's relatively low in terms of value, whereby uh, main uh, export to the United States, which to a large extent are smoked salmon, uh, very um, high added value products, uh, are, are um, oriented towards the United States. Uh, and that's, as most of you have been following ob obviously and or studying the impact of the, the Russian ban uh, here you can see that uh, globally at least for EU exporters the boom of the demand in Nigeria definitely absorbed by far uh, available uh, pelagic and mainly mackerel that were available in the in the um, in the EU so it was it wasn't a bad year for uh, small pelagic export in the EU last year uh, very much on the contrary. So you could see over 34% increase uh, in Nigeria alone. I mentioned uh, EU, EU intra-trade and here you have the figures I, uh, I mentioned already. Uh, again, you find the, the same, uh, same three products in a different order uh, which are being traded within, um, within the EU. Now, uh, because that was also uh, one of the, the issues of, uh, of this, this presentation, uh, I'm actually very happy to have the opportunity to discuss with you this project uh, for different reasons. Uh, the main one is that now it's working, uh, and that's quite an achievement in itself. We have been through a long, long time of preparation. Project, as you all know, takes sometimes a bit more time than you expect, face some IT difficulties uh, that takes a lot more time than you expect, uh, but well, the day it's solved, you're you're quite happy with that. So that's that's my case now, uh, and more importantly, uh, that's a service that can deliver and and uh, and touch on the the targeted groups. Targeted groups of the project for us is uh, mainly business operators focusing on EU producers. Uh, mainly policy makers to support decision making and, and researchers. So that's why uh, for me it's a great uh, opportunity to, to discuss this with you uh, today. So as you can see it has been a long process, uh, some feasibility study um, and development in, uh, in the last five years. Uh, but this time was needed because a lot of the work and I would say even innovation was to work on uh, methodology harmonization codes uh, that requested a huge amount of uh, expertise and, and, and time. Uh, some of you were, were involved in, in this work. Um, then a critical time was also the, uh, the CFP and the CMO, CMO reform. Um, because then uh, market intelligence became a new mandate of the, of the commission. And here we are now with a, a new phase of development. So basically, as from now, uh, it's not really just to wonder if the Commission would like or is interested in developing some kind of market intelligence tool. It's, it's clearly a mandate, so we, we have to deliver on that. Uh, that's that's uh, why the Parliament and the Council uh, define some uh, new, new role for the Commission on, on this. And uh, that's why some budget has been allocated to uh, to market intelligence in, in the MFF. Uh, so this is not something which is on the pilot phase anymore, but it's something that is, uh, that is structural. So there's, um, there's a new role, for, uh, uh, and new role and new mandate of the, of the commission in this, and that's, that's important. So it's uh, something which is here to, to stay. 
Now, uh, the starting point was uh, how to get uh, market data, how to compare events, wh what is happening after the, uh, basically after the landing. Uh, that's the first thing. And this is things I've been hearing around uh, in the last two days very much as well. So this is still, uh, still um, a, fa a fair point. The other thing for us was also what do we do between the time Eurostat is publishing its data and now, which is usually three years. Uh, so that's, to make very short, the, the main objective was to publish and do something meanwhile. What can we get as data to, to support our decision between official statistics are available and, and what is happening and now. So that was the, two, uh, the, the reason behind the, behind the project. Another thing is that a lot of data are available. If ever they are, f they are more or less harmonized, they are in the different languages, in different websites. Uh, so quite m large effort has been done also to harmonize um, and, and translate and make available. We did a uh, lot of work in harmonization uh, and aggregation. So if we are delivering information on 86 um, commercial species, which represent some 95% of the market. So this is a market intelligence tool. So this is, this is not that we, we are not uh, committed to the very same rules of, uh, of statistics. Basically, whenever we have data, we publish them. So if we have, let's say, first sales data for Belgium uh, that Two days ago, we published them. We don't wait all the members to, to provide us with data. And when France, UK, Italy data come, we publish them in, um, following that. So that's, that's, the, that's the rule, and that, make it, uh, that makes the, the freshness of, of data quite, uh, quite an important uh, asset. Uh, so basically, that's, that's the core thing, a single database in a single website. Very soon we'll move uh, into a, a web application translated in all EU languages. Uh, the good thing with data is that you don't need to translate them, you just need to translate the name of the fish. Um, and that's also important that the Commission makes things, uh, data analysis available in all, e in all languages. Uh, may not be the case for you, but discussing with uh, fishermen organization, producer organization, they know their business, they may not be comfortable with uh, working with English, basically. Uh, so, they, so that's very important. Uh, it's a bit stating the obvious, but that's very important when we talk about um, accessibility of data or analysis. A uh, language issue is, I believe, uh, uh, an, important, uh, an important point. We found out that with some, uh, some of the grouping uh, the grouping were a bit too broad, so we'll be also add, uh, adding some few new, new species. The objective here is to cover the whole supply chain. So we deliver data on first sale, wall sale, import, export, processing, and consumption. We are not inventing data where there's no data. Typically, wall sale, uh, this is a structure that you find in France, Spain, and Italy. Uh, as, you s as we discussed before, this is already 70% of the business and the cash generated by fish. So this is, in, this is interesting to, to deliver. Um, now we'll also do some work uh, on providing data analysis on household consumption and um, out of home, home consumption. We found out that more, maybe more than other food and other protein, uh, fish is being consumed in uh, catering and commercial restaurants. Most of a very large part of people access or get to eat fish away from home, more than, uh, than other protein. So this is a segment which is interesting to analyze when we do uh, uh, supply chain analysis or marketing uh, analysis. So we, we are working on, on this. We're also working on to reach exhaustiveness as much as possible. Uh, that means getting more data from countries that are delivering just partial data uh, or getting new, new member states in. 
We already have a very large coverage, but we have some work to do with countries like Croatia that just joined uh, Poland. Um, and to some extent with, with Spain, we'd like to get a bit more, more detailed data, and this is something which is, which is ongoing. So basically, this is it. This is a website uh, currently available. You can't see that, but it's here. Uh, in English, German, Spanish, and French. Uh, so there's different way of approaching that, like I would say a static way and active way. A static way is uh, typically some publication. Um, as from now, uh, we publish every month um, a market newsletter, which is now translated into French and Spanish as well, for the same reason uh, of access, accessibility I explained before. Uh, we also, and that may be interesting, for, we also publish a uh, large annex. means e all the data we discuss and we publish in, in this publication are detailed in charts uh, in annex. So for some, uh, if there's an issue, this is interesting for your work, you will get uh, the de all the detailed set of data uh, published at the, same, at the very same time. Usually we cover uh, we tend to cover two countries and two species by countries, and we, we, we change uh, every month. We have a case study mainly focusing on price transmission or uh, trade issues. Uh, so that's what we've been covering in, uh, in recent time. We all started last year with an a yearly publication, which is the EU fish market. So that's the 2015. Uh, 15 will come in in two months' time, where basically we found that there was not such a thing as uh, an overview of the EU market. There's very good publication at, uh, at national level in France, Spain, UK, or Germany, uh, but you can't really get uh, the uh, EU pictures. Uh, and we had some positive uh, feedback on that, so we will will continue uh, will continue to work on this. Uh, and we'll try to, ex to develop some, some additional work within this uh, more structural analysis. And we do case studies. Um, we do case studies especially on the price, um, on the price transmission. Um, the UMOFA team has developed a methodology to analyze um, the supply chain. So this is available to, to all of you interested in, in this field. And we try to do some case study to, to test the methodology. So that's what we've been doing with fresh coded in UK, ask and Pollock in uh, processing in Germany, and Sivas, uh, uh, Brim, sorry, in Italy. I'm running out of time, so uh, I won't present this to you. Uh, so we do some first analysis of the, of the market. Um, identify apparent consumption, try to structure the, the price along the supply chain by trend, and at the end of the work, try to be able to, so it's more cost, it's not a cost analysis more than a margin analysis. Uh, but the idea was what to get to this. So how can you slice, put in little slices the different process of the, of the supply chain? Of course, there's some areas. Uh, net margin, this is to some extent, at some point, is getting confidential. This is, this is business. But it's also to see, uh, to contribute to the debate on how comes that uh, a Seabrim X farm is 4 euro and it gets to 10, sometimes 15 or 20 at retail stage. What happens in between? What is the content of services? What are the costs incurred in the supply chain? So that's, uh, that's very practical things. So it's based on data we have. It's based on interview uh, and interview we have with processor or people in the, in the supply chain. Uh, and this is a work we will continue with, uh, with other case study. We will update the one we've published um, already. Now, that was the, let's say, the passive part of the services of Humofa. The active part is uh, a database. Uh, it, I think that's already quite uh, an innovation since there's 
a lot of publication or market analysis are made available by different operators and public administration. In practice, uh, they are very detailed. Very often they are in PDF format being published, uploaded um, every week. That means that if you're interested to, to tap down in your Excel sheet all the data, then you have a database. But if not, you're just uh, stuck with, um, with this. What we provide here is something on which you're completely uh, independent to build up your, your work and, and your request. And that uh, now that, as you see, some we've been starting that for some time, so we have quite substantially long uh, time series, both on f from first sale to, to trade. First sale, you get between three years to five years. We have trade data for 10 years, uh, and this you're building. So basically, as all, uh, as all database, you have the list of possible options. You shop around, I would say. You select your filter, and, and then you run your query. It can be very aggregated, or it can be very, very detailed. Uh, I really recommend to, for you and your students to, to try it half an hour. Because um, once you're quite used to it, uh, you just need to change one parameter to run it again. Uh, so there's a relatively low entry cost, uh, and then that makes um, relatively low <laughs> uh, for database. And then, uh, then once you, you're into it, you really uh, can uh, easily change parameters and, and develop your work. Of course, you can uh, export it in Excel in PDF uh, as, as you wish. Uh, you have also this function, which is data supply monitoring, whereby if you wonder to what extent the data set is complete, uh, which is not always the case, uh, then you just can click there and we report all the data set as uh, when they arrive. Uh, so what week uh, is covered, what, is, what months are what year. So then you know exactly what is, uh, what is there. So here, other example, um, you can, as I say, you can go into detail, so you can compare let's say, the same seaboard, the same species in, uh, in five, six different arbor in Europe, in different countries. Uh, again, operators or researchers tend to focus very often on the very same thing or similar thing. Same area, same species, same country in arbor. So once you, you, get, um, you get used to work on that, uh, you come back a month later, just refresh, and that's it. You can save your query. Uh, and then you have, um, you have all it stored in, in, in your account there. So here's another example with, uh, with trade data, just to show you that if you want to go into details also on preservation and presentation, this is something which is available. So you want to know if we, imp uh, we imported more uh, frozen, uh, frozen or fresh card, or is it uh, fillet or, or not, or wool. This is information you can get. And of course, in trade analysis, this is quite uh, substantial detail. Uh, it does make price very different uh, for, for obvious reasons. We just put online a uh, video uh, tutorials, five minutes, uh, so to help you to, to build up a query and, and understand how, how this, this works. Very quickly, because I'm late, uh, some example of things you could get. So, just to show you, we have long time series. You can, you can uh, get details at uh, arbor, le arbor level. So here we focus in Portugal or Smackwell. We could have had other, other arbor, other countries, uh, but then you can, uh, you can do some work. Here's about a uh, very quick snapshot of supply chain uh, in the case of Hague in France. So you can, you can get also a three year series on. Uh, First sale in Lorient, wall sale in Rangis, export and, and retail prices. And it's about trend. I mean, it doesn't really matter if some weeks are lacking. You, you have, it's better if you, just, if you have it all, but you still can, can do some work out of it uh, if you have a series long enough. And then again, the f you can get up to very, uh, so as I mentioned, you get data as, as they come. So here's week 15 for the first sale. Uh, for export is week five. It just, but again, uh, trends matters more than uh, exact exact prices. We 
try to do some work as well on the retail. So here we are comparing uh, price of uh, place and sold in the Netherlands and how they, how they, they trend. Uh, there's interesting analysis and story be, behind that. Now, uh, development we expect in, in, in the future. Uh, first, and this is important for, for our work and possibly for use, we'll move from delivering um, first sale prices to deliver first sale volume, value, and prices. So that, that of course, made uh, capacity to analyze trends just not uh, much more precise and, and weighting uh, different uh, events. Uh, we'll do uh, and we'll develop some work on a prospective tool. This is something we haven't started yet, uh, but this is part of the, of the work we plan to do too. At least to, cert to start analyzing what are the main determinants of the market. Uh, I don't know to what extent we can model everything, but at least trying to see what the magnitude of things that impact uh, on fish on fish market, and we'll see how it goes. So uh, a new market intelligence now fully functional. Uh, we do use it in our work uh, when we prepare negotiation, uh, when we want to give value to quota. We have, uh, we have a tool that can give uh, a good, um, good reference and, and fresh data. It's here to stay. Uh, there's the mandate for that and there's the money for that. I love to ask you to challenge it, try it, circulate it. Uh, I know some of you that, uh, many of, several of you told me, I tried some months ago and then, uh, you know. so. Give it a second try. I think it's worth. Uh, I understand your point, but now it's uh, it's much better. Um, I'll also try in the short while, and that's a message for you. If you get to put some of your students or yourself to to this, in, I'd like to put in place an expert panel. So uh, and to to bring them together at some point uh, at some point of the year, just to get uh, expert feedback on what could be improved. So uh, if you're interested in, if, if you're working with, with it in the, in the future and you're, if you're interested to, to be associated in development, uh, please just, uh, just contact me. Uh, we also expect this to be integrated in current. Uh, there's a lot, this major research project are, are about to start now, uh, success and prime fish. Uh, so we expect to be, to be, uh, to be discussing with, uh, with project coordinator. And just to, to find, and that's the really final word, uh, my feeling is now we are in the post-reform economics. So there's a lot of things we have been uh, deciding, stating. Uh, at some point, we'll, we'll need to analyze them. Uh, I put it that way. Does, does sustainability pay off? And here I'm not talking about MSC. It's if we get to more sustainable stocks, is it good for fishermen? Are they making more money? Are they better off? Uh, and it's not that true everywhere. We've seen some cases uh, underutilization of quotas increasing. So because the price are no good, people just don't fish. So there's some, there's some interesting uh, marketing issue to be analyzed in the, in the future. Um, so thank you for your attention. You have my contact here. Thanks. <laughs>
Is that not a little bit too high? Not only a little bit? Those are the, the price we, re we, regist we receive from, uh, from the, I think, from Europe panel or from the Dutch administration. Uh, it, hmm? it is at retail, right? It is at a retail price. This is not a lending price. If we talk about Spain, this is in it's not so expensive if we talk about Seoul. This is at supermarket level. Sorry. Yes, at the retail. In my country, you might pay 25 euros for a kilo of soul. And we are supposed... For, for place, you might pay 9.5 in Spain, and in, in uh, the Netherlands, is higher. So it, it makes a lot of sense for me. I can double check the, the source, um, but yeah, that's the that's the the price at retail we we are we are collecting. But what was interesting here is that at some point there was in in the place there's some boost in price due to the the fact that this is one of the European fisheries most MSC certified. So there are there are things, so it's about nearly 30 percent of the of the fishery which is MSC certified. So there's, there's quite a demand for, for this in the Netherlands. At the same time, uh, there's the species, and we, we did a study last uh, in, in the monthly highlights uh, two months ago on, on this. It's one of the, the species where the rate of um, underutilization of quota is the getting the biggest. So you have more quota, but people don't necessarily fish them because they don't, uh, they're not happy with the price they are getting. So you have this really peculiar and interesting for, for place to see high level of uh, MSC, some form of price premium but more market access issue, and the rest which is still additional supply but are still trying to find, uh, find its way on, on the market. And that's, uh, that's something to be, to, that, that is interesting to, to, to analyze. Uh, thank you very much uh, for these two extremely uh, uh, enlightening presentation on the uh, evolution of the uh, fish uh, market worldwide. I have a number of questions. One of them is, uh, who is going to get the jackpot for finding the aquaculture marine species that is vegetarian? Because if we you look at the uh, freshwater aquaculture, it's obvious that it's been picking up because uh, we could uh, count on species that are fed with uh, um, cereals or other sources of food, not with other fish. And, uh, you know, if you want to increase marine aquaculture, it looks obvious that you have to find species that can be fed with uh, uh, cereals. That's one question. The other question I have is, years ago, FAO was looking at things like uh, support to developing countries to uh, create uh, joint venture to develop their own fishery sector. That was in the 70s. Now, is FAO now giving advice to uh, developing countries in how to develop their sector for processing and marketing of fish? Giving information through the uh, Globe Fish is extremely helpful, but also telling them who can invest in their sector, uh, who are those uh, uh, actors who are investing in, the, in these sectors presently. Doing the same in Europe would be interesting also, seeing the evolution of the uh, structures of production both in Europe and in the rest of the world would be extremely interesting to anticipate uh, the uh, changes that may occur in the next few years. Relocation of the industry, competition uh, between different actors, different countries, different uh, um, sources of uh, funding, capital investment, etc. All of this is something that seems to be uh, lacking at present. And I would suggest that uh, even if members of the EAFE could uh, conduct some research on this and provide this type of information to the uh, managing authorities of the uh, 
structural funds investing in the uh, processing and aquaculture sector of their own countries, uh, giving them a picture of who is, who are the actors in the sector, where are they located, where are they uh, locating their new investments would give us a picture that we could uh, use to anticipate the next five years evolution of the uh, processing and of the aquaculture sector, not to mention the fisheries sector. Thank you. Thank you for that. For the, the first question related to um, what kind of species, especially in marine capture fisheries, you're absolutely right that most of the increase in aquaculture development or in production supply in tonnage has recently come from um, inland uh, brackish water or freshwater and not marine. And one of the constraints traditionally in, in marine capture or marine aquaculture has been the, the feed, especially the feed component coming from, um, from fish meal or fish oil, in particular fish oil. But at the same time, it's true that the component of fish feed has changed over time. The, um, the percentage now represented by fish oil has come down uh, to a tremendous degree. And the vegetable content of feed to salmon, for example, or trout or bass or bream or shrimp has come down much, much uh, compared to what it was uh, traditionally. At the same time, also, uh, the sourcing of the fish feed component has changed. In fact, now almost 40% of the raw material used in the world to produce uh, fish meal comes not directly from capture fisheries, but indirectly through the processing industry. So we, we spoke both about the EU market and other markets, the demand going much more towards fillet. And by producing those fillets, we also produce a lot of other products coming from the whole fish that we are not eating directly. And that now is going to uh, into fish meal and to some extent fish oil production. So it's almost 40% now of the raw material for fish meal comes from leftovers or from other parts of the fish. What type of species, we don't know. And I don't think anyone knows. There are so many trials and tests all over the world uh, going on. Um, some are more uh, successful than others, and I think the jury is still out on the species that we will see as, as the winners in 10, 15 years' time. But I think you are right that the fish or, or the feed component will be a, will be a determinant, uh, not only because of cost, but the, the, uh, the feasibility of growing significant volumes of particular species will be related to, to feed. The second issue, uh, it's and joint ventures and other types of, of collaboration or industry development. It, it's true that FAO in the 70s and maybe early 80s uh, provided a lot of advice on joint ventures. Uh, for all sorts of reasons, we are not doing that anymore because of lack of capacity, but overall in FAO now uh, we are paying more attention to value chains over, over all the importance of uh, small and medium-sized enterprises the uh, development of a business-friendly environment in uh, the food production sectors, not only in, in fisheries. So indirectly, we, we are working on that. At the same time, the World Bank is doing much more work within the fisheries uh, sector that they've done 10, 15, 20 years ago. And also other development banks are providing advice also to the benefit of setting up structures that will drive the industry. But FAO is not doing uh, this um, directly, but it's an issue that also many of the development agencies are now focusing more on, including NORAD, for example, in its new strategy has business development as one of the uh, focus areas within the fisheries development. So certainly it's something that we in FAO cannot ignore and uh, we'll try to spend more time and focus on it than we've done over the last five to ten years. Um, could this be a result of the demise of domestic fish stocks and therefore an adverse outcome 
of countries now having to import stocks they would have otherwise got from their domestic supply? Uh, no, that, that could be the case for certain countries, of course, individual countries, but that would be an exception because overall, uh, when trade has been increasing, both exports and imports have been increasing, and I'm not aware of any particular cases, but for certain species, of course, it could be related to certain species where the stocks are, are down, but overall that is not the, the, uh, the, 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 the solution or the, or the answer. I wouldn't think so. Please. Well, this is a question for Xavier. Uh, you showed some very interesting graphics showing where the uh, increase in the price of the fish was taking place because of certain activities or because of the loss of some uh, shrinkage, uh, whatever. Um, it seems obvious that if you want to keep the uh, EU fish um, production competitive fa when faced to international competition, you have to reduce these, uh, these costs. Uh, how can you do that? probably by concentration, by vertical concentration or vertical integration, um, or some other innovation. Um, are you working on, the, on this particular aspect? Are you developing any uh, you know, strategy to support the uh, competitiveness of the EU fish processing uh, industry so that they can re reduce these costs and, and maintain their competitivity? Okay, uh, thanks. Thanks for the question. Uh, not really. Uh, basically, the work here is very much on on providing more transparency and understanding of, of what, what is happening. It is very much also to answer what we get fairly from uh, producers and politicians. Again, how comes this cod is landed worth two euro and I found a fillet, which is basically a bit of slice of the cod, 25 in the, in the fishmonger. Who is cheating here? So that, that's something that was, uh, uh, it's not only for fish, this is in the food sector very much, but who is taking the biggest part and is it an unf some unfair practices in, in the sector? So here the work was more a bit analytical, trying to slice the supply chain as much as possible and to see that uh, without much judging on this, to see that there's even a sea brim, which is, is not processed much, uh, is produced, you take it out, you, you empty it, you, you put it on ice and you sell it. So it's not that much, but still, the very same product, there's a lot of content in services uh, because it's, uh, uh, it's fragile products, uh, the supply chain should be quick and efficient. There's a lot of, uh, as you can see, a lot of different intervention. Everything is cost. Uh, so it's true that at the, at the end of the day, the part of the product itself uh, in the retail price is, is reduced. Now, um, then there's different strategy out of it. You can do direct selling. Some aquaculture uh, producers are, are doing that. Uh, some fishermen are doing that in the air uh, At a large scale, this is, I mean, selling is a job. Uh, you can't be at sea and in the shop uh, at the same time. And selling fish, that means not only selling your fish, but being able to deliver minimum 20 different type of fish. This is. Normally, that's what consumers expect, to have quite a large offer. So that means a big part of the work is buying, bringing together, presenting in, in a safe, uh, safe and, and nice way. So, that's, uh, so it was this, this work led to some conclusion that, yeah, there's a lot of services. Uh, even if the product looks the same, in terms of content, uh, it's not the same at all. Uh, and there's a lot of intermediary. Uh, some could be uh, rationalized, some could be internalized, but probably not all. Um, so that's, that's, that was a bit of the, of the story. Then if we, the analysis we did more on, for example, for the German, the, on the German fish finger is different. Because here it's a large community being imported, 
huge companies in Germany, concentration of, comp of things. Uh, main drivers is the import prices. So for the ad hoc, what everything happening in international markets in the US or, or Russia has a very strong impact on the production cost. So this is a different story. Um, but, uh, but for more fresh products, that's, yeah, that's what a bit to, to explain the, the story. More, more cost analysis than a margin analysis.